So good morning everybody. I was assigned the topic of Trinity for today, so let's start with the multiple choice so that we are sure do you know what is the Trinity? Number A, the name of the lead female character in the Matrix move, movie, Triology, something Catholics believe in, the name of several girls only Anglican colleges, or all of the above. This is the outline of what we are going to do. Uh, first we'll talk about why we need to talk about this, uh, why is it important. Then we'll have a look at what do we believe as on the Adventist Church, uh, why we need to talk about it, what is the problem with the Trinity, and what is the biblical response. So why do we need to talk about it? We need to talk about it because most people never think about thinking that goes beyond thinking. So, because Adventism started in 19th century North America, East Coast, uh, the middle generation and the older generation of Adventists have this 19th century idea that you engage with reality directly. What you see is what you get. Which is how everybody in 19th century was thinking. However, today we know that we don't engage with reality directly. What you see says more about you than what you see. If you look at the x-ray of your leg, if you trip and break your leg, and a specialist who studied uh, medicine for a number of years looks at it, do you see the same thing? If you take a leaf and put it under the microscope and you look at it, and somebody with a <coughs> PhD in dendrology, which is the science of trees, looks at it, do we see the same thing? And so today we know that it's the presuppositions, or as Germans like to say, Vorverständnis, the pre-understanding, determines what you see. What is the filter behind? And in a lot of this discussion you can talk about the Trinity and you talk past each other because we are not clear on the filter and the presuppositions that we have in our mind already. Secondly, when I was a young pastor I used to argue a lot because I grew up with this mentality that if we present the truth, the sincere soul will see it and snatch on it. And uh, now the older I get and, you know, you go to this Q&A period and somebody jumps up and says that King James Version is the only version of the Bible and if we don't have it we cannot prove Adventism. I, I tend to argue less and less with people. Usually I would say, hmm, that's very interesting, brother. Do you know how you came to that conclusion? Do you know, how do you know that what you know is true? And, of course, this is the science of first principles the epistemology. Throughout the centuries people came with three answers to that. The first one is reason, Plato, then John Locke with experience, and of course we believe that God's revelation is the way how you approach the reality. Now here just one sentence. While reason and experience are very useful tools, they are insufficient as ultimate sources. So every time you talk uh, about a trinity with uh, a Jehovah's Witness, you will hear something. But the trinity cannot be true because I cannot understand it. I cannot comprehend the idea of one in three, three in one, and so it cannot be true. Oh, you just said that reason is your ultimate epistemology. Is it for us as Christians? Or is there a truth out there which is bigger than my little head and my understanding? Every time you speak about uh, Sabbath you, or healthful living, you can be sure that somebody will say, well, pastor, that sounds interesting, but my grandfather smoked a pipe and he'll live to be 90 years old, which is an argument from experience. We all agree that the God's revelation is the way to go. Now the question is, how do we interpret the revelation? And so we'll talk more about that. The second thing that is important, or the third thing, so the presuppositions, the filters that we have in our mind, the pre-understanding, the epistemology, what are we arguing? Are we trying to prove the Trinity rationally? Are we arguing from our experience? What? 
which is for all of us limited. My experience is an experience of a middle class, middle aged, white male from Central Eastern Europe. An experience of an old female lady from Sudan will be very different than mine. And how do we understand God's revelation? The second thing one, which needs to be clear before we talk about the Trinity is the role of doctrines. Because we are all children of post-enlightenment, there is this idea floating around that when you come to the heavenly gate, there will be there, enter your username and your password. And if you give the right answers, you are through. What's the role of the doctrine? And accord, because we are children of post-enlightenment, this is very strong in the current mentality. So if you say that Earth is flat like a pancake, you are a fool forgotten here from unenlightened eras. But if you say it's like a football flying in the middle of nowhere, you gave the right answer. And so people tend to think that if you got the right doctrines, you are through. <coughs> so a lot of consumer mentality in our churches is just waiting for the second coming because we have the right set of the doctrines and when Jesus comes, he will recognize his own and uh, usher us into the warmth of heaven because we, we got it right, we got the truth. While, of course, Revela uh, John 17, 3, eternal life is so that they may know you. It's a relational experience. So salvation is not a reward for precisely defined and believed doctrines. The role of a doctrine is to deepen our relationship with Jesus, to make it more practical, livable to make us more loving, gracious, and tolerant person. If our doctrines do not make us more loving, gracious, and tolerant, what's the point? And in this sense, doctrines are important. But the salvation is not the reward for the right doctrines. So you can believe in eternally burning hell and still be saved. Now, it's not easy to believe in God of love if you believe in uh, eternally burning hell, because basically God says, either you love me or I kill you. But some people manage, you know, they do the mental gymnastics and they manage. There will be people who will keep their first Sabbath in heaven. According to the Bible, there will be people who will ask, uh, what are these scars on your hands? That means they never heard the message of the cross. And God might say to one of you, so you have been a departmental director of the division, go and explain to them what is the meaning of the cross. The doctrine of atonement for some of the theologians. Yeah? So this is so important to understand what is the relation between the doctrines and the practical experience. Doctrines are important because false doctrines ultimately devaluate our relationship with God. And the last one connected with this uh, introduction. When we approach the Bible, the, the thing that is different for you and me is that the Hebrew mindset asks the question why, which is so well expressed in the French pourquoi. Every time I used to teach the, the doctrine of Christ, the Christology MA class at Newbold, you can be sure that somebody is going to ask in the class, okay, so Jesus got 23 chromosomes from his mother, Mary, where did the other 23 chromosomes come from? Because you know that for a new human being to be born, you need 23 chromosomes from your father and 23 chromosomes from your mother. And if one, just one is missing, you get Down syndrome, mongoloism, you have debilitating consequences. Where did the 23 chromosomes come from? Now, it's an excellent question. The problem is... It's a legitimate question, it's a Greek question, which asks how. So the Bible will tell you, pourquoi, for what purpose Jesus was born, Matthew 1, 21, so that he can save his people from their sins. But the Bible will not tell you how he was born. The virgin birth of Jesus is not a doctrine so that you know, you get a recipe how to mix a virgin birth in your kitchen. As long as you use the right ingredients, you get the same cake at the end of the line. And we struggle with this all the time. 
You can be sure if, when I taught the Christology class that when we spoke about the death of Jesus and the meaning of it, that somebody would raise their hand and ask, so when Jesus died on Easter Friday, what happened to his divinity? Did the divinity die? Once again, excellent question. The only problem, a Greek question. And because you ask a Greek question, you don't have an inspired answer to it because none of the writers of the Bible, and interestingly enough, even Luke, Dr. Luke, who is a Greek, still has a Hebrew mindset. So none of the writers ask that, those Greek questions, which means my answers are as good as yours, and yours are as stupid as mine. The problem is not that we have a filter, point number one. The problem is if you are not aware of it. The problem is not that we have a Greek mindset. I mean, all science is based on this. Our lives have been incredibly improved. None of you would want to live 500 years ago. Why? <laughs> because of the Greek mindset. We have the research, we have the discoveries. The problem is that once you start asking Greek questions to the Hebrew-inspired writings, you get into a mess. You get into difficult situation, especially when your reading of that text, you try to impose that on everybody else. So this is so important. When Christianity started from the Jewish thought, it encountered the Greek mindset. And it needed to define what it believed about God, about the Holy Spirit, about the Church, and other things. The doctrine of the Trinity is not an absurd mathematical notion that 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. It's, it's something else. So, let me put it this way. I would never argue with anyone about the Trinity. The word Trinity does not occur in the Bible. Trinity is how the early church in 3rd and 4th century defined face-to-face -face Greek philosophy what they believed about God. This is the response of the church in certain part of the world, in certain time, this is what we believe about God. Uh, once again, when I used to teach Christology class, I would hand out to students the Chalcedon uh, the statement on uh, Jesus Christ and I said and guys have a look at it and if you can improve on it come and talk to me you can be sure you will get <laughs> an A you will get a good grade why? because the best heads of Christianity already spend significant time and energy on thinking through what we Christians believe and of course the consensus was that people read it and said wow this is so precise. Okay, the language of hypostasis and persona, etc., is the language of the 3rd, 4th century. But wow, the best heads of Christianity already spent significant time on this one. Now, we need to be aware what they believe, what the conclusions they came to, why they formulated it this way. So, when we say that God is one but three persons, now you need to understand that in a Roman theater you put a mask in front of your face and that is the role that you play. That's the persona. You are a new persona. So, that's what the church fathers say when they say God is three persons. Okay. But, if you are unaware of it, if you ignore it, you know, the problem we often get in these anti-Trinitarian discussions in the church is that people who had no clue what the early church believed, what the fathers wrote, never read anything besides their own Bible, come up with far-reaching conclusions. This is how it is. And that's where the problem is. You don't need to make all your mistakes yourselves. And we always say to theology students, guys, study church history. It will be very useful in your ministry. We know you don't appreciate it now, but remember, when you come to the church and that brother comes to you and says, Pastor, I have just discovered this new light that no one has seen before. 
you can tell them, relax, brother, this is just an old heresy that the church condemned in the third century. Somebody already struggled with this and came to the answer, this is a dead-end street. This is no no-go area. And so, th this is so important to understand. Yeah, the more you understand why church came to this conclusion, that this is what we believe about God, the greater appreciation you will have of the amazing hard work and the depth that went into this throughout the centuries in Christianity. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is the end result of a long process of thinking about the way in which God is present and active in this world. So you have the Old Testament which presents God as the creator, as God who hears and sees, who engages with his people, brings them out of Egypt. And then the New Testament comes and says, and this God revealed himself through the person of Jesus. Okay, so then we have two gods. No. Shema Israel, here or Israel, our God is one. So how do you put it together? How is this God present and active in our world today? And uh, Jan quoted uh, Acts 2 this morning for the devotional when Peter says, and this is the evidence that Jesus is the king because he sent his Holy Spirit just as prophet Joel prophesied. You can see that that God is still active in the world. And because of the theophania, the wind and the fire, which are the sure signs of God's presence, that God is among us, everybody knows, wow, God is here in a powerful, mighty way, just like in the days of patriarchs, just like in the days of our forefathers when they went out of Egypt and they were guided by God's presence. And it pricks them in their heart. Because God is here between, among us. So the doctrine of Trinity is basically an attempt to bring together the incredible richness of Christian understanding of God. How do you put together who God is? And this idea that God is not just a celestial policeman sitting on the throne. God is someone who is walking on the dusty roads of Galilee and he's willing to wash your feet which he did for Judas, his betrayer if it helps you, God is going to wash you, your feet at the last judgment because this is who God is and who God is he is the quiet voice that speaks to you when you can't sleep at night and tells you Daniel, that wasn't the best way to respond if you continue behaving like this this is not going to have a good impact on the relationships which are the most precious to you and you hear things you don't want to hear because that's who God is who doesn't want to overwhelm you and speaks in the quietness of your conscience conscious the Trinity is an expression of the Christian experience of God in the light of the scriptural foundation the Christian church did not discover Trinity did not, sorry, did not invent the Trinity. It was how they understood the witness of the scripture. The scriptural witness to our Christian experience of God came first, and the Trinity is the reflection on it, which came after three, four hundred years of hard reflection. Why? Because the Bible presents God as a dynamic being. He's not only transcendent out there, outside of space and time, different than you and I are, who live in time and space and need uh, air to breathe and food to eat. God is transcendent being, but he's also a dynamic being, both, both within himself, and that's why we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the relational being, and in his activity in this world and in the universe beyond this world. The plurality of oneness shows that God is a dynamic divine being whose mode of existence is active and interactive rather than a distant deity which is inert and passive. And as I will show you in the conclusion, and this was a genius thing that the church in the third and fourth century chose the right path in which to go. 
because the all other options would be just plain ridiculous for us in 21st century. So, how God leads fallible people that in the important times of church history there is a path that shines and some choose it. It's just encouraging. All right, so that was uh, the introduction why we need to talk about this because of our filters, because of our uh, epistemology, what do we base our conclusions on, and because somebody already worked hard on this. And if you know, you can be blessed. If you don't know, you are going to repeat mistakes of the past. And to paraphrase the story in Luke 6, uh, manuscript Beza D. Uh, it says that Jesus found someone picking up the sticks on Sabbath. He said, if you know what you are doing, you are blessed. If you don't know what you are doing, you are cursed. So it's an apocryphal story from some of the variants in the manuscripts. Uh, what do we believe about um, uh, the Trinity as the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Church? Uh, you know that the first statement of beliefs was in 1931 to give... Uh, <coughs> People who ask about Adventism, a picture, this is what Adventists stand for. And so uh, this was the first statement. You will see how with the three statements that we have, it's, pro, it's continually refined language and it's expressed in a better way. The Godhead or Trinity consists of eternal Father, a personal spiritual being, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, infinite in wisdom and love, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the eternal Father, through whom all things were created and through whom the salvation of the redeemed hosts will be accomplished. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, the great regenerating power in the work of redemption. Notice that God is a personal being, but it says nothing about the personality of the Holy Spirit. Jan will speak about it after the lunch. Uh, in 1980, the Dallas Statement says there is one God, God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. Notice this one already says that they are all from eternity and they are all persons. So the Holy Spirit cannot be a power. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all. So the Latin terms have been exchanged for proper English terms. And ever-present, he is infinite and beyond human comprehension, yet known through his self-revelation. He is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. And the latest one after San Antonio, there is one God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. And the only new thing here is uh, in the last sentence, God, who is love, is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. And the text are uh, updated um, so they better reflect uh, the direction of the scripture rather than proof texting, as was the case originally. Mm. This is the latest statement uh, regarding the Son, and uh, Tihi will speak more about what we believe regarding Jesus. Interestingly enough, uh, in 1931, we did not have an article of beliefs. Uh, we had 20 fundamental beliefs about the Holy Spirit. So all you had was uh, here that uh, the Godhead or Trinity consists of the Eternal Father, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. That's all what we had. Nothing about, not a special article about the Holy Spirit. Then in 1980 in Dallas, we got a special article, number five, fundamental belief about the Holy Spirit. Notice how Geniusly, this is written so that the umbrella is broad enough even for those who are not there on the journey yet to be able to sign this. So just as the article on Jesus is not going to specify did Jesus have a human nature like Adam before the fall or Adam after the fall so that both groups within Adventism can feel 
comfortably in that umbrella, under that umbrella. Notice that this one says, God the eternal spirit was active with the Father and the Son in creation, incarnation and redemption. He inspired the writers of scripture. He filled Christ's life with power. He draws and convicts human beings and those who respond. He renews and transforms into the image of God. Sent by the Father and the Son, vis-a-vis -vis the Orthodox uh, theologians. So we identify with uh, classical Christianity. The Holy Spirit is from the Father and from the Son. To be always with his children, he extends spiritual gifts to the church, empowers it to bear witness to Christ, and in harmony with the scripture, leads it to all truth. Notice how the latest one after uh, San Antonio tightens the screws, as has happened not only with this one, but with some other articles. God, the eternal spirit, was active with the Father and the Son in creation, incarnation and redemption. It's the same as what, and listen to this, he is as much a person as the Father and the Son. This is a new sentence, and so, yes, in line with classical Christianity, it uh, expresses the personality of the Holy Spirit, but, okay, if you are in the minority of anti-Trinitarian group within Adventism, then you cannot sign this. So, this is what we believe, this is where we stand. Why is it important? <clears throat> it's important because this is the dividing line between the Orthodox Christianity and uh, sectarian mindsets. So Jehovah's Witnesses are not considered Christians because they are Aryans, they believe that Jesus is a created being. Mormons are not Christians, Latter-day Saints, because they don't believe in Trinity. The question is, is Seventh-day Adventist Church a Christian, Protestant Church, or is it a sect with its own set of beliefs? And that's why this is important. So, we talked about what do we believe in the Adventist Church. Let's uh, talk about why is this problem. Why do we need to talk about it? What happened in Adventism? Mm. Jerry Moon has a useful uh, six-period division of how the doctrine of Adventism, of the doctrine of the Trinity was perceived in Adventism. And you can read it in his article. I, I saw that Jan has it in his uh, footnote there. Uh, in Adventist uh, Andrews University Studies is the article. Let me start from the, uh, from the end. The reason why we discuss it now, although it wasn't the problem for the last 50 years, more or less, in Adventism, is because uh, until 1964, you could always say, just like Noah preached the flood for 120 years and then the flood came, we are going to preach the soon coming of Jesus and then it will happen. But after 1964, Adventism entered a period of identity crisis. How long can you say Wolf Wolf and still be taken seriously? And interestingly enough, <laughs> In 1966, Robert Pearson is elected General Conference President at the GC session in Detroit. And soon uh, <clears throat> he starts a new program of revival and reformation, finding the answer to why are we here more than 120 years after the Great Disappointment. Uh, what is our role? Why are we still here? What is the reason for our existence? It used to be clear. We are the only ones who are preaching the soon coming of Jesus, living and preaching the right doctrines. God has no one else but us. And if we are faithful, he will come and collect us, take us in the celestial airbus to our heavenly home. <clears throat> after 174 years of great, after great disappointment, this is not so clear. Why are we still here? Adventism worked incredibly well well, with the shortness of time mentality. Let's pull out our sleeves and get the work done. Let's finish the work. And you look at what we have done in, in uh, missions, in community services, ADRA, <coughs> in education, in um, health ministry, hospitals. This church has the largest Protestant system of uh, hospitals, the largest Protestant system of uh, uh, church schools, etc. It's all back to this mentality. Jesus is coming the day after tomorrow, so let us pull our sleeves and get the work done to finish the work. 
Because if not us, who else would do it for the Lord? Now, after 174 years, it's increasingly difficult to maintain this mentality. And so, different people came with different solutions why we are still here. And it needs to be said that as a result of those different solutions, we are more fragmented than at any time in history. In 1844, the uh, United States had uh, 37 million people, the population, versus uh, 300, uh, what is it, 20 million nowadays. So the Miller movement was something which was on the first pages of newspapers. It was a public knowledge. Some historians say up to a quarter of a million people identified with Miller's movement. And when the great disappointment comes in 1844, the church is thrown into a difficult situation or 300 believers of a quarter million decide there must be something in that experience. Remember Ellen White said, I was never so close to God as during the months preceding the great, control, uh, the great disappointment. Mm. There must be something good about that experience. What was it? And because they are humble and teachable, they come up with new perspectives and God can open things to them that he could not teach the university professors. Because the university professors who have the Plato's model of reality, they know that in the holy heaven there is nothing to be cleansed. It just, no. You are forgotten here from an enlightened year. But because these people are humble and teachable, they discover things like the second coming, <coughs> post-millennial, pre-millennial second coming, uh, sanctuary, Sabbath, non-immortality of the soul, etc., etc. And then for the next 44 years, the fact that Jesus is coming soon is going to drive the system. The investigative judgment is taking place in heaven now. And how are you going to be judged? Depending on the testing truths that we are believing and preaching that no one else does. The way to pass the judgment is to believe and preach and live the testing truth that only we have. And then they gather at the <coughs> session, general conference session in Minneapolis to discuss which are the three horns that were uprooted from Daniel 7. But they asked somebody who was young, educated and from California to have the morning devotional. And Adventism is for a big surprise. Suddenly, they discover that, yes, God taught them certain things because they were open and humble. And here's the question for Adventism. Are we still open and humble to be taught and to discover that we are not the only ones that God led? That all the truth does not reside with us. We don't have a monopoly on truth. And you know from history how um, Ellen White says that if Jesus appeared to the delegates, he would have met the same fate as um, during the Easter weekend in Jerusalem. When people say, we are here to preach the three angels' messages, our job is not to preach righteousness by faith, let leave that to Baptists. Our job is to preach the law, and Ellen White, if she did not defend the young guys, what would be the outcome of the Adventist church? But she said, no. We have been preaching the law so long that we have become dry like the hills of Gilboa. Let the law take care of itself. Righteousness by faith is three angels' messages in verity. This talk about the pillars, they don't know what they are talking about. Of course, she's a Methodist. Of course, she's going to support this change, which brings how we are saved does not depend on our performance, on our it's not a reward for our true doctrines. It's based on the finished work of Christ that he accomplished 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. And suddenly, Adventism is going to be driven by new soteriology, the whole system. And interestingly enough, you know, there are three pioneer founding members or pioneers of Adventism. Joseph Bates, James White, and Ellen Harmon, who later became White. Joseph Bates and uh, William, uh, James White 
are the members of Christian Connection, which is a restorationist movement in 19th century America. In other words, they say there was a great apostasy that took place in early Christianity and uh, Luther started the movement of going back to the roots. We need to restore the early church. While Ellen White is a Methodist. She never had a problem with divinity of Jesus. She never had the problem with Trinity because she grew up as a Methodist. And 1890, she publishes her major book, Desire of Ages, in which she says on page 530, in Christ there was life original, unborrowed, underived. In other words, Jesus is not a created being because she realizes that the new soteriology will require a new understanding of who is our Savior. That our Savior is God from eternity. Mm. Cannot be a, a created being because then he is in the same situation as we are. If someone is drowning, you need someone to save you who is not drowning with you. Mm. Otherwise there are two drowning, of us drowning. And that's why Jesus needs to be different than you and I are. Leroy Edwin Froome in 1928 will publish a book, The Coming of the Comforter, because the new understanding who saves us will require a new understanding of the role the Holy Spirit plays in the process. All right. Uh, as a re uh, this uh, result of the discussion with evangelicals, the book Questions on Doctrine, or full title, Seven the Adventist Answer Questions on the Doctrine, is published. And this throws a bomb into Adventism. The result of that is that, or the reason for that is that Tom Un Unruh, Pennsylvania Conference President, gets an interaction with Donald Barnhouse, a famous um, Calvinistic Presbyterian preacher, and he writes to him, I was the other day traveling home listening to your lectures on Romans. And so I am writing to you to thank you for your ministry and I thank God for people like you who preach righteousness by faith with such a clarity. May God bless your ministry. Signed, Thomas Unruh, Pennsylvania Conference President, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Donald Barnhouse writes back and says, Dear Brother Unruh, I am very surprised that you liked my preaching on Romans because we know Adventists don't believe in righteousness by faith. So he writes back, oh, this is a misunderstanding. Of course we believe. We are a Protestant church. And Barnhouse write back, writes back and says, no, 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 no. When I was growing up in Baltimore, we had Adventist kids playing with us, and they were legalists. They knew nothing about righteousness by faith. And Thomas Unrooks from Pennsylvania, it's not far to Tacoma Park, takes this correspondence to the GC headquarters and says, look, Guys, we have been in this country for over 100 years and people have no clue who we are as Adventists. They think we are some kind of a sect. They don't understand that we are a Protestant Christian church. And that's why when uh, uh, Walter Martin starts uh, discussions with uh, different groups writing a book on American sects, they open the door, unlike Christian Science, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, and they say to him, what are your questions? Let's talk. As a result, the book is published, but that creates a new whirlwind in Adventism. Donald Barnhouse, when he wrote an article in Eternity, he was the editor of Eternity magazine, he wrote an article in Eternity magazine. We had discussions with Adventists, and we have Adventist leaders, and we have discovered that we have been wrong. They are genuine Christians, and they should be perceived as such. You know the price Barnhouse paid? for saying this, 30% of his subscribers cancelled their subscription. They said, you must be crazy. You don't know what you are talking about. If you say that Adventists are genuine Christians, they are true Protestants. Of course, in his article he says, but as with every other church, uh, group, on the margins there are some wild-eyed fanatics who see things differently but those who believe as their leaders explain to us should be received as genuine Christians and treated as such. Of course, when M.L. Andreessen read that on the margins of Adventism there are wild-eyed fanatics, there is still a discussion whether the Spirit of the Lord descended mightily on him or the little demon jumped into his heart. 
The world was never the same again. And here comes the reason why we talk about these things. People say, you know what's the problem in Adventism? You know why we are still on this planet? Because the leader started the discussions with evangelicals. We need to return before 1956. Or 1888 message. You know why we are still here? Because the church rejected the message in 1888. We need to do a corporate repentance. In other words, the solution for the present crisis is to go back. Is to return to a previous understanding. That's why we have this discussion. It's a discussion. We live in a world which is vastly different from the 19th century world in which Adventism was born. Adventism today has matured and processed things differently than Joseph Bates and uh, James White processed them. And for some people, this is so confusing, so difficult to live with, that the solution is let's go back. Let me just say, the Bible starts in a garden and ends in a city. Because it's not possible to go back even for God. You have to go forward. So there are different types of Adventism. And this has consequences. But the main reason why we have this problem, everywhere around the world where historic Adventism has a stronger hand, after 1980, roughly, according to Jerry Moon and his classification, this problem of anti-Trinitarianism started. Because the solution for the present day crisis in Adventism is go back. Go back. And so if the pioneers believed in a certain way, so should we. And if we just believe as the pioneers believed, Jesus will come in no time and we will enter the pearly gates of heaven. So, these are the implications for Trinity. What would be the role of Trinity in this period? When the testing truths and the pillars of Adventism are discovered. You know what will be? It will be unimportant. That's not our job. Our job is not to preach the Trinity. Let somebody else do it. Or for some, because remember, two-thirds of our pioneers are from restorationist movement. Why are we in this mess? Some bad guys <laughs> cause this confusion. And so anything that comes from them is suspicious. By the way, do you know who defined the canon? Which books go into the Old Testament? A Sunday keeping, infant baptizing, immortal soul believing Catholic Church. And they got it right. The question is not who came up with it. The question is, did they make a good decision? When the demons say in New Testament to Jesus, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. Does the fact that demons said it make it untrue? Of course it's true, even if the demons said it. Because it corresponds with reality as is revealed to us as we perceive it. And analogically, even if the GC president says something which is not based on the scripture, it doesn't make it right. Because we are not asking, okay, so who came up with this doctrine? We are asking, when we opened the Bible in 2018, does it correspond with our understanding of the Word of God? Now, once you have sorted out how we are saved, what happens? Suddenly, who saves us is very important for our understanding of the process of salvation. So you get a new understanding and appreciation of the role of Jesus as a mediator in heavenly sanctuary. You got a friend in the court, it will be a public lecture that Adventist evangelists are going to preach. Suddenly, the role of the Holy Spirit, proper pneumatology, proper teaching about the Holy Spirit will be important. Now, in 19th century East Coast American village, where Adventism started, there are two churches. 
we can be sure of that. One is Presbyterian, which is an American way of saying Calvinist, and the other is uh, Episcopalian, which is an American way of saying Anglican. And the question that everybody asks is, where is the truth? Which church is God's true church? Now tell me how many people on the streets of London and uh, Copenhagen and uh, Zagreb <laughs> and Bucharest and uh, Stockholm or Athens can't sleep at night because they say, man, I don't know where is the truth. Where is the truth? I need to know where is the truth. If you ask these people on the streets of any European town or city, what's the most important thing to you? You know what is the answer? My family. Relationships. Do you think that we have something to preach to them? Something to tell them? Here's the problem. If the essence of ultimate reality out there is truth, then you are going to judge everything and everybody by your understanding of truth. Now, hands up those of you who have a perfect understanding of truth. None. And you become a hypercritical, judgmental person. But if the essence of ultimate reality is that God exists in relationships, then the relationships are the most important part of this universe. And though people tell you that relationships are the most important uh, part in my, important thing in my life, do you know what an average American father, let's use the statistics from behind the pond, you know how much time an average American father spends with his children per week? Nine minutes. Yeah, between nine to twelve minutes. So they say the relationships are the most important for me, but they cannot put it into practice. Adventism has something to offer. You have come to the kingdom for times like this, to paraphrase the words of Mordecai to Esther. If the essence of ultimate reality is relationships, the doctrine of Trinity has something to offer to today's world, in this part of the world. Here is the bottom line, here is the question. Is the role of Seventh-day Adventist Church to promote the views of pioneers? Are we a club for perpetuation of the views of the pioneers? In Moravia, there is this uh, famous place, Austerlitz in uh, German, Slavkov in uh, Czech, where there was an important battle that Napoleon fought and where he was defeated. And there is a historic society which every year they dress into historic costumes, they dress their uh, horses and they reenact the Battle of Austerlitz because they feel it's an important thing to remember that here in Moravia, in this for forgotten corner of Europe, one day there was an important battle fought. We are a historical society for preservation, the memory of the battle which took place in uh, a couple of hundred years ago. Here's the question. Is Adventism a movement to preserve the views of the pioneers? Or is it our role to ask in 2018, how do we understand what the Bible is telling us when we open the Bible today? What is the Spirit telling us? And to quote Ellen White, is our job to follow the zeal and commitment of our pioneers, but to walk in the light that shines on our path? in the understanding that we have in 2018? Or is our job to return to the understanding of 1960s, 1980s, or whatever in between? To conclude this, actually, the most important part of the 28 fundamental beliefs are not the fundamental beliefs. It's the introduction, the preamble, which says this is these beliefs constitute the church's understanding and expression of the teaching of Scripture. This is an expression how we understand the Bible. A revision of these statements may be expected at a general conference session when the church is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller understanding of biblical truth or find a better language in which to express these teachings. In other words, it says there will be more. God hasn't said the last word yet. 
The role of Adventism is the present truth, to be open to the leading and the guidance of Holy Spirit. So, what is the biblical response? To conclude, as I said, I'm not going to argue with, about Trinity with anyone. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible, just like the word millennium or some other words. However, the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is not a created being and the Holy Spirit is a person, not just divine power. The Bible also rejects modalism, that in the Old Testament God reveals himself as a father, in the New Testament he reveals himself as the son, and in the era of the church he reveals himself as the Holy Spirit, but it's still the same person. At the baptism of Jesus, you have Jesus standing in the water, Father speaking from heaven, and you have the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. You have all three persons at the same time present in one uh, place. So modalism is rejected uh, by the Bible. This Sabellianism, which by the way, on a folklore level, those in Adventist churches who are not anti-Trinitarian, a large number of them will be modalists, will be Sabellians which is not a biblical model. If Jesus is God, who is not identical with the God of the Old Testament, so he's a different person, yet there's only one God, how do you make sense of it? And if we had more time, I could show you how the New Testament authors constantly refer to Yahweh of the Old Testament, applying the same passages to Jesus. Showing Jesus and Yahweh you can use those same words for them. Actually, in the second um, Corinthians 13, 13, in the words of the blessing, Paul says, and the love of Jesus, the grace of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with all of you. If you can put Jesus in front of the Father, that means they are on the same level. Because if they are hierarchically ordered, you can't do that. You can't write a letter from TED and in the, we send you our greetings from the reception, the president, and the treasury staff. Mm, yeah, there is certain understanding. If the Holy Spirit is somehow involved in our experience of both God and Jesus, without being identical to either of them, how do you make sense of it? And the Trinity is the answer that the church gave. The God who raised Jesus Christ from dead from the dead, is now present in the church through the Holy Spirit, and it's the same God who was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and who brought Israelites out of Egypt. So one picture, why we need to have the Trinity? Because one picture, one image, one model is not enough. You need three to capture the richness of who God is. God is not just a celestial policeman who sits on the throne and bosses everybody into submission. That's a wrong understanding of God. God is someone like Jesus. And when it says Father and the Son, it's just a metaphor. When Jesus says to sons of Zebedee, you are uh, sons of uh, thunder, he doesn't want to say that thunder conceived them. It's just a metaphor. Oh, okay, so let me come to the conclusion. The doctrine of the Trinity is a summary of the Christian answer to who God is and what is he like. It is like a synopsis of a story. The story of creation, redemption and renewal. It is a story of God who broke the mold of human thinking, forces us to stretch our ideas and categories to their limits in order even to begin to perceive something about him. And that's why the properly understood doctrine of Trinity protects us against simplified, distorted, inadequate understanding of God. It is the reminder of a majesty and mystery of God who gave himself for his people on the cross. It's not the last word in our understanding of God, but enables us to avoid inadequate, distorted ways of thinking about him. A little bit like, uh, was it... Um, uh, Churchill said about democracy. It's not the perfect system. The problem is nobody invented anything better. Trinity is not the last word about who God is. The problem is, until somebody comes up with anything better, that's all we got. When the early church was faced with a choice between God who could be understood, simple, 
monistic God. But then he would be different from the evil matter. And that's why he could not get his hands dirty and redeem the creation. Or a God who could engage with us, be active and present in our world and thus redeem us. Yet, one in three, three in one, therefore, almost impossible to comprehend. It adopted the second option. And when we look back 2,000 years later, we can see, wow, there was God's hand in that. Because there is no other better option. And the last one, Geoffrey Paxton in 1977 in the book uh, Shaking of Adventism said, Ellen White is used in Adventism as a wax nose. Everybody turns their, in their own direction. So that's why I didn't give you the, any quotations uh, from her. But as a conclusion, let's read this one. Had the fa Godfather come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling his glory and humbling himself, Humanity might look, that the humanity might look upon him. Listen, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding his record on his own condescending grace. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. Inside, in hearing, in effect, it's the voice of the movements of the Father. They must be on the same level. Because if they decided to divide the roles differently, then the Father would have come to this planet, the Holy Spirit would remain sitting on the throne, and Jesus would be the one who would be testifying about the Father. The story of redemption would not be changed. Why? Because they are on the same level. <laughs>